So the tendency of a vector field to rotate, to spin a tiny little sailboat that we place into the vector field flow uh, is sometimes called the circulation density. So it sort of tells me an infinitesimal measurement of circulation, not along an actual simple closed curve, but along an infinitesimally small simple closed curve that we might place right at that point in the xy plane. Um, and so our authors go through the trouble of doing the calculations and the, the, the limits and all that stuff to show where this differential quantity comes from. Um, but ultimately, what they come up with is this expression for the circulation density of a vector field f1 comma f2. It's the x partial derivative of f2 minus the y partial derivative of f1. In other words, a way of thinking about this quantity, uh, and the reason that I don't call it circulation density, I call it scalar curl uh, for the following reason. So I don't call it circulation density, I call it scalar curl for the following reason. Um, that really what I have here is I have my vector field, which has the components f1 comma f2. And what I'm really doing secretly, or perhaps not so secretly, is I'm taking a differential operator. I'm going to call it the partial with respect to x, the partial with respect to y. So think about that as though it's a vector. And that what I'm doing is I'm taking the scalar cross product of those two things. If we remember what the scalar cross product of two vectors in two-dimensional space looks like, right? It's we multiply the first component of the first with the last component of the second. And so what I get there is d by dx of f2. And then I subtract the product of the second component of the first and the first component of the second. So d by dy of f1. And I subtract those two things from one another. So what the authors of our book call the circulation density, um, I like to call it the scalar curl, um, just because this gives us a, a way of remembering how to compute this thing, right? It's a scalar cross product of this vector, quote unquote, that's made of these di uh, partial derivative operators, d by dx and d by dy, with the vector field f1, f2. Um, and one of the reasons that that's a nice way to remember it is that in three or four classes from now, when we meet the three-dimensional version of this, when we want to do all this analysis in three dimensions, it's the same kind of operation, except we're going to replace the scalar curl that we did here, the scalar cross product, with the vector cross product, when we have a vector field that has three dimensions. And then our differential operator here will have a d by dz in its third component as well. Um, but so this is how I like to think of where this circulation density function comes from. It's nothing more than the scalar cross product, the scalar curl. Um, where I take this differential operator and I take the scalar cross product with f1 and f2. So our authors are calling that the circulation density. Uh, and so the next activity that we're going to do um, is to take what mercifully are three relatively straightforward uh, vector fields. So they're not going to be two difficult computations to do. Um, one of them, actually all three of these, are examples that showed up in their graphical forms in our first activity. So part C is going to have you analyze this one. Um, parts A and B are going to have you do these two. Um, and so your goal is going to be to compute the scalar curl of these vector fields, and then see if you can match up the answers that you got here with the answers that you got in the preview activity that we started out with for today. So you found out that for the first one of these vector fields, the minus yx example, that the scalar curl was the number 2. And that implies that everywhere, so it doesn't depend on x or y, everywhere in the xy plane, the rotation, the infinitesimal rotation associated with this vector field is counterclockwise. Um, and that is actually exactly right the example that we looked at as the first vector field on the preview activity up here. Uh, that was this one that rotates counterclockwise everywhere in the xy plane. The second example, the vector field xy, um, the scalar curl was equal to 0, which implies that there's no rotation anywhere in the xy plane. And that was this second example that we looked at in the preview activity. The third, 1 minus x comma xy, um, that one has a scalar curl equal to y. And so the rotation, which direction the rotation happens, depends on y. And the particulars of that dependence is that for y values that were positive, let's go back to what that looked like uh, a minute ago here. For y values that were positive, we ended up getting counterclockwise rotations. 
because the scalar curl is equal to y, and so when y is positive, we get counterclockwise rotation. When y is negative, we end up getting clockwise rotation. So all these places that are below the x-axis. And for those y values that are equal to 0, so the points that are exactly on the axis, that's where we get places that don't infinitesimally rotate at all. Um, so the scalar curl function really does tell us what we're trying to, what we're trying to learn here uh, about these uh, vector fields rotation or the tendency to rotate or not rotate, right? That when the scalar curl is positive, we're getting counterclockwise rotation. And when the scalar curl is negative, we end up getting clockwise rotation. And it's when the scalar curl is zero that implies that we have no rotation. And there are some vector fields like this example and like the example before it that are not just zero, the scalar curl is not just zero in some places, it's zero everywhere. And we call those vector fields irrotational. Yeah, uh, Peter, question.